Ah, so it's so good to be here and on this side of the stage. Um, what I want to start with, with about is something that happened actually 24 years ago um, uh, to this week. And I was on a camping safari with my, with my family uh, in, in Nairobi, in, in Kenya. And the scary man with the machete is my father. And uh, I used to dream about things like, I hope the lion doesn't step on my tent tonight, and things like that. And my little sister there, just coming back from doing something. And, but what's interesting about this trip was that on this trip, all the airplanes took off at the same time and flew back to Nairobi because this happened. Black Monday. This was the event that shook the stock markets around the world, 1987. There was a big business convention happening, businessmen's convention happening in the game park where we were at. That's an interesting story. Let me tell you another one. So I went to school with a girl named Stella. Uh, we lived, we, I went to a boarding school, it was up country Kenya. And uh, that's interesting, but it doesn't mean much to you. Her last name is Kino though, and so a few of you might, that might ring a bell, right? Because her father was a guy named Kip, who won the first gold medal for uh, the 1500 meters in, in 1968 in Mexico City. And that's great, right? And what I've done right now is show you two stories, two pictures about Africa that fit your idea of Africa. And I could tell you more. I could tell you about how we moved from Sudan to Kenya because the war started, or how the people we lived around were in abject poverty. And that too would fit your lens. The idea of Africa is a concept. It's an abstraction. And for many of us in the West, it's a reality based in a historical context. We don't think of the 54 countries. We don't think of the 2,110 languages. If I were to bring you a prop, I might show this one. There's another prop, though, and that's this one. This is the cheap $80 Adios phone sold in Kenya that actually people travel to Kenya to buy. Uh, Paul Collier makes a great statement. He says, the dysfunction of Africa has become a part of business folk memory that keeps Western multinationals from doing anything. And what I'm here to tell you about is that the Africa of the 80s and 90s is not the Africa of today. So that's this place, this place, this place. And that could be anywhere in the world, right? But that's in Kenya, that's in Nairobi, that's the iHub and the M-Lab, uh, the places that I work in, that 5,000 other, 5, other techies from all over Nairobi call home. So where is this innovation happening, though? That's not the only place, and we'll get to that more in detail later. It happens on the streets. This is, a, um, uh, this is for welding. And you'll find it anywhere uh, from Accra to Nairobi. This is an invention made by a farmer upcountry Ghana. And it's a, he took the idea from a medical uh, dispenser device and said, I could use that same idea to, to plant maize, to plant corn. Or it could be like this guy, Robert Mburu. Uh, I'll show you this closer. Robert decided he was going to make a device that would be a security system for his home because somebody stole his TV and he's in university. So this is in Nairobi and he said, I'm gonna build an 11 phase system that if you don't, 
if you, if you don't turn it off in time, it gives you a 400 volt shock, <laughs> okay, through the door handle. This can kill you, okay? And so this is, this is the kind of stuff that's coming up. It's, it's things like this, right? This new mobile kind of revolution you hear about in Africa. It's real. One of my favorite things about innovation is something that Maria Popova said, which is that years of, it comes from being, of years of being intellectually and creatively active, curious, and awake in the world. That's absolutely true. But it also comes from what I think of as a product of two things. That is knowledge and resources. So in this case, it's knowledge of how to use very rudimentary tools to make something. This is an old bicycle converted into a bellows. And resources, this is everyday scraps that you find around you on the streets of Nairobi, which is a whole business in and of itself. And you make things like this, paraffin lamps that are used across the continent. Or it could be resources like this, or knowledge like this. This is uh, a group of, of women coders in Nairobi called the Akira Chicks. It's just a group, an association. And uh, they use their knowledge of computer science and how to code, married up with their knowledge of how people use the phone, their resources. And they create tools like this, Imfarm, a tool for farmers to know what the prices are around them, and, to, uh, and for buyers and sellers, co-ops, and, uh, and everybody else in between to do and, and make transactions. Or it could be guys like this. This is Francis Carey, an architect uh, from uh, Burkina Faso. He uses his knowledge of architecture mixed with traditional loam construction resources found around on the, in the ground, literally, around him, to make schools like this. And by the way, his work is found from Switzerland to Japan. So we do events, things like Maker Fair Africa, which I'm one of the organizers of, and Michelle is helpful with that as well. Uh, so this is what in Nairobi last year. Cairo happened just last week. I wasn't able to be there. Uh, and, and in it, you see some very interesting things, some of which you've already, we, I've already shown you. Now, there's, there's another event that we put on this year called Pivot 25, and here we're taking high-tech ideas, people who are doing mobile apps, and we put on a big competition in front of the jury, and they've got to stand up there, and they've got to make a case for why their idea should be invested in. This is kind of new. Right? You're not thinking that this is happening in Africa, but it is, and they're being grilled, and they're being asked why that business idea should be worthy of investment, not a donation. So the IHUB has 5,000 plus members. We have had 120 plus events there. Uh, we've, um, less than a month ago, we had Vint Surf as a guest. It's one of those places, right? People come through, and the community uses it. Uh, we, we took that idea and said, Okay, there's other labs starting to pop up around Africa uh, as well. How can we band together and make ourselves a bigger target for both investors and for media? And, uh, and so we filmed Afro Labs. It's, four, uh, it's five organizations right now uh, in, in four different countries. And by the end of this year, we're going to have 15 in nine different countries. And you can see them listed there. And again, the bigger target for investment. This is uh, James Wybo uh, John Wybochi of uh, Virtual City, winning the $1 million Nokia challenge last year, beating out the Chinese, the Eastern Europeans, the Americans, the Indians, the, and everybody else to win that $1 million investment. So I'm going shift, to shift a little bit here. I'm going to talk to you about something that we've heard about uh, from Andrew a couple times. He talks about white space. So what is, what is white space? Well, the, the, the real business definition of this is it's where rules are vague, authority is fuzzy, uh, budgets are non-existent, and strategy is unclear. Well, this is also, is, you know, we use it in business to think about what happens between the organizational chart. Like, if I've got a guy above me and there's, just, you know, who's doing the stuff in the middle, right? And, and especially when it has no budget. It gets interesting then, right? And so I couldn't help but think that this looks a lot like white space to me, all right? We heard, we heard Robert talk about it. There's no rules here. Let's go back to that. There's rules are vague, authority is fuzzy, budgets are non-existent, the strategy is unclear. See that? OK. Ideas happen on the edge. Ideas happen in places like Kenya. They happen in places like Nigeria. They happen in places like India. There's something else that's interesting that we've seen. 
where there's a culture for entrepreneurship and there's less regulation, that's also where ideas happen because things can, can move. And I'm gonna give you a couple tales of disruption uh, are, that are coming from Africa. The first one is something that many of you have heard about already. It's uh, M-Pesa, it's the mobile, phone, mobile payment system, peer-to-peer -peer payment system that we have in, uh, in Africa, in, in Nairobi, in Kenya. And uh, here you can see a kiosk, and you can see that there's actually four different types of payment systems you can do, use with four different mobile operators. It's just that M-Pesa has kind of won out on critical mass. Since it's in existence, it's done more than $8 billion of transactions peer-to-peer -peer within Kenya. This idea is being exported to the world. This is the model that people are using. Another one is uh, on the web side is Ushahidi. This is an idea that was born out of the post-election violence in 2008. In that first week, uh, Ori and David and Juliana and I, we, we banded together as a volunteer group and we, and we made this platform. And we had no idea what we were getting into. It was rudimentary technology, but it was the use of technology that was different. And our idea was simply to say, can we just capture the information from ordinary people? People with just a cell phone, just a, just a dumb phone, really. And, and, and that's what we did. And that idea, as you can see, has taken off around the world. Uh, the most recent massive use, use case of it is in Japan where the Japanese took the platform, they customized it, they ran it off seven servers, it was such a massive deployment, just to, uh, just to do their post-earthquake and tsunami and radiation uh, issues. But it's been used in 20,000 places, 132 countries. The next one is a social one. Um, Mixit is a social network that you use your phone for. It's a feature phone based one. And it came out of South Africa. And it has three times the size of Facebook in Africa. Uh, sorry, in South Africa, which is exciting. Um, but it's also exported to Eastern Europe and, and the Philippines and places like Indonesia. And it has actually about 24 million users, I think, at the last count, uh, all, over, all over the globe. About 13, 12 to 13 million of which are in, are in South Africa. So again, this is something that we need to think about, this reverse distribution, right? The reverse distribution of ideas and products and services from places like Africa to the rest of the world. That's what M-Pesa is doing. That's what Ushahidi is doing. That's what Mixit is doing. So why does this matter, though, 7,000 miles away uh, from my home in Nairobi? It matters because the world's fastest growing economies the top one is Ghana, in Africa, of course, and there's five more. There's four more. There's five out of the top 10 are in Africa. Now, some of them are small. They've got a long way to go, right? But it's, 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 an, it's a trend that's, that, we're, that we're seeing. We're seeing that 313 million people are now moving into the middle class ranks in Africa, which is 34% of the continent's population. We're seeing a predicted minimum increase, 5% this year, 5.75% next year of growth on the, on the continent. So this is a fun slide I, I just put together, which is three years ago, we used to see this prediction, right? I used to use this slide. And then what happened was we grew faster than expected. 98% of internet subscriptions are mobile. Think about that for a second. They go through a mobile ISP, right? That's a massive, massive paradigm shift from the ISP uh, ideas that we have here in the US and Europe. This is a picture uh, from um, about five to six years ago in Africa of the, of the undersea cables that were coming in. This is the one that is currently there. It's a major difference. Right? We're seeing this massive increase. Okay, so things are cheaper and faster. In fact, I get beta, better data access, not just in Nairobi, but in some of the smaller cities around Kenya than I do in Camden. <laughs> and, and here's this, the only thing that you need to know. If you're in the business and the technology world, this is the only thing you need to know about Africa. We have decreasing costs on just about everything on the technology side. And we have increasing adoption middle class that's growing. 
this is a sweet spot. If you're an entrepreneur, why would you want to be anywhere else? So to riff off of some of, the, of what Unity said, and which I, I really appreciated, is that the future of Africa is bright. The sun isn't rising on Africa, it's risen on Africa. And it's the youth and the technology that's actually really leading the way here. The final thought is to, is to think about the world rebalancing. And that is that we shouldn't be surprised to find that solutions to the problems that we have here coming from places like Africa. And to, and to, and to riff off what Unity said one more time, it's this that we shouldn't be trying to look at make Africa more like us. We should be thinking about how Af we should be more like Africa. Thank you. <laughs>